what I'm going to talk about is a little about plant sciences. This is the UK Plant Science Federation. There are a lot of changes going on with policy at the moment, and we have a real opportunity to have our voice heard. So I'd like to say a few things about that. Some of you might not know anything about the James Hutton Institute, so I think I'd better say something about that. They are our parent company, uh, and we're a wholly owned subsidiary. Uh, I'd like to say a little bit about science and innovation and product development, and a lot of that revolves around plant breeding. So, life sciences. Life sciences, to me, having been a botanist and a lecturer in microbiology, is the study of all living things. However, if you look at government policy around creating wealth from life sciences, it is all around the healthcare industry. Where do we fit into that? Um, and that was from the Scottish Government, but it's no different down south. The Bioindustry Association, I used to be on their communication panel, and, and the director of SCRI was one of the first directors of the BIA. After the attitudes towards GM crops, they dropped plants. Where's our voice through the Bioindustry Association? However, think of plant sciences. Still, we have 25% of all drugs that are still derived from plants. Think of that economic impact. Think of the nutraceuticals that we still extract from plants, whether it's evening primrose. I know we've heard a little bit about biofuels, but still there is a policy uh, in Scotland that 11% uh, of all energy will be from biofuels. Uh, forestry leading to tourism, animal feeds, chemicals, etc. It's all there. Plant sciences are fundamentally important to the growth of the economy. So we have national life science strategies. Uh, they're focused on healthcare. Scotland has its own, as one would expect. There is no mention of plants. However, I did notice and was quite pleased that raspberries, and hopefully one of our raspberry varieties, was actually on the cover of the life science strategy. But that was as close as we got. So I pose a question, do we need a separate agri plant science technology strategy. It is good that politicians are starting to talk up farming and the importance of farming in our food industry. The food and drink industry is one of the biggest contributors to GVA in the UK. So these are some of the comments George Osborne was making. David Willits in January this year said that agri-science is one of the eight great technologies for economic growth. Um, also owned Patterson, that really the climate is changing towards GM. For those of you who don't know, in Scotland there is a moratorium on the use of GM crops. Uh, therefore, when we want to do field trials, and we had some of the biggest field trials at SCRI, the, one of the predecessors of the James Hutton Institute, uh, we're now not allowed to have field experiments of GM crops. Uh, also in the news is about the vulnerability. We've heard about uh, the global challenges, the Beddington perfect storms. Um, in the very first lecture of, uh, of this conference, uh, we're going to get more extreme events. But last year was pretty extreme weather conditions from drought to flooding. And what that meant was that uh, wheat production was down by 13%, potato production down by 25%. When we have levy boards that actually are reliant on the levy of the crops we produce to funding some of our science, these sort of reductions have a massive impact on the amount of money available for science. So that's about the gloom. Um, the good news is that the government, and partly driven by George Freeman, who was appointed by Cameron as the uh, UK life science advisor. One of the first things George Freeman said is he wanted to broaden the definition of life sciences. George is in fact the MP for Norwich, so the people from John Institute will know about him. He also was a venture capitalist, so he was in the biotech industry and apparently comes from a farming background. He said he wanted to broaden this definition to include plant, food, microbial sciences uh, in life sciences rather than it just being about healthcare. So at the moment, the government is developing a strategy. They have received, they've gone through the evidence base where people and organizations have been asked to submit evidence to it. And on Monday this week, I was down at a preliminary findings. 
They have produced a draft, they have a purpose, and they've appointed now um, a leadership forum. There is still a chance to have your voice heard. And I would recommend all those people who haven't actually made submissions here that they actually do so. It is about growth and it's about economic growth. But as I'm going to show you later, the impact of plant sciences on uh, economic growth is really quite considerable. Um, these are the people on the leadership forum. And it was good to see Ian was here yesterday and... Uh, uh, chair the session and people you will all know someone on here that you can consult with the leadership council membership they actually said part of their purpose is still to get information and to actually uh, uh, take forward that information they're talking about what are the metrics of success uh, what are the um, what are the priorities and maybe one of the interesting things will be who decides what those priorities are. But I thought you might be interested in that. My plea to you is uh, if your organization or as an individual, contact these people and find out more about it. A little bit about the James Hutton Institute. It's just recently celebrated its second birthday. It was a merger between the Macaulay Land Use Research Institute and Scottish Crop Research Institute here in Dundee. It's possibly the largest, um, it's certainly the newest uh, research institute looking at sustainability and looking at global challenges of food, water, energy security. Um, for those of you who don't know who James Hutton was, he was part of the Enlightenment. Um, he was a farmer. He was a bit of a bon viveur as well. He had some interesting recipes for carrot brandy, of which you took about a ton to start with of carrots and topped and tailed them. Uh, interestingly, he is the father of geology, uh, or is thought of as one of the fathers of geology and discoverer of deep time. So he was a bit of a polymath uh, and is uh, uh, really, uh, our institute is named after him. The James Hutton Institute has two main sites, one here in, uh, in Dundee and the other in Aberdeen. It has two commercial companies, one of which I've been running since the early 1990s when I left the university. It also has some very important partnerships, and one is with the University of Dundee, that, uh, with the School of Life Sciences, that uh, the plant scientists are co-located with the scientists at the James Hutton Institute here in Dundee, and I think that is really important. The other thing I'd like to say about the James Hutton Institute is I used to have PhD students as well. It has over 120 PhD students, and for a research institute, that's a lot. Um, uh, and uh, I think it is a very good source uh, for the education of the PhD students. Um, here, these, uh, the, one of the things about the James Hutton Institute is it has many different scientific disciplines, and uh, many of these you can read are plant-based. Uh, I did have to actually increase the font size of the plant ones this morning, uh, uh, particularly to this audience. Um, a little bit about science and innovation and our relationship with with what was SCRI and is now the James Hutton Institute, is one of the definitions I give for science is the conversion of money into knowledge. That's what your grants are. They are to make knowledge. And a definition of innovation is the conversion of that knowledge into better products, better services. It could also be a better quality of life as well, to put a social angle on it. And that's the relationship between the James Hutton Institute and Milnfield. We are a separate company. We are not funded by government. And we have, since 1992, generated profit every year, and we make gifts back to the Institute or to the Milnfield Trust to support um, scientific education and, uh, and the development of science. Um, why did we set up a, a separate company? Uh, the main thing I want to talk about here is really to act as a bridge between science and industry. And that's really important, that sort of partnership. Also, we can do things a little faster, maybe, than research institutes when it comes to employment. We're employing 30 people at the moment, 
and most of those are either analysts or uh, plant breeders or work in plant breeding teams. And we also have a degree of independence from the government because the government don't support us um, at all. Um, we have lots of different pathways to, to market. A to A is academic to academics, uh, sorry, in terms of partnerships, uh, business to business, academics to business, A to B. All these partnerships also can either be national and uh, international, they can be public-private. We actually participate in most of these. Uh, intellectual property is important to us in the form of plant variety rights. Uh, and also by working with an institute such as the James Hutton Institute, we can do a lot of demonstration because seeing is believing and we need to do more demonstration and more outreach demonstration in different countries. So, I hope most of you have heard of Scottish Crop Research Institute or the James Hutton and many of you in the audience are actually associated uh, with them or employed by them. Um, some of you might not have heard of Milnfield Research Services, but many of you will have seen and consumed our products if you live in the UK. I use this slide around the world. And the main one here is that we're really proud of the fact that in every single food retail outlet in the country, you will find a product that we have helped develop, uh, and it's developed by GlaxoSmithKline and is Ribena. Uh, all the black currants in Ribena were developed here in Dundee. And it's, that's a fact that most people in Dundee actually don't know. So, you know, these did you know sort of facts. We also breed potatoes that uh, James Hutton Institute uh, uh, at Dundee has most probably more potato research in all the different disciplines going on than anywhere else in the world. Uh, we also breed a lot of fruit, as you'll see in a minute. Um, all these are products of plant breeding. Plant breeding, too, is a brilliant translation of science into better products. Um, partnership, we can't do this. We actually do breed finished varieties, but we can't do this unless it's in partnership with industry. So these are some of the industries that Milnfield works with, um, uh, with our breeding programs. These are our core crops. Uh, we pre-breed barley, but most of the research on barley is uh, around um, barley molecular genetics. Uh, we do have finished varieties of, of these crops. Today, I am actually launching this sort of more or less officially is a campaign towards provenance of where was your plant variety developed. And there is a breeding industry in the UK, and Penny Mapleston is here from the British Society of Plant Breeders. Uh, I think it's really important. This is a bit of a follow-on from the Olympics. It's clearly a play on words. We've done one for pigs, for the pig genetic companies that are very successful as well. And uh, we just want people not to confuse them with yet another logo, but for people to actually ask a question, what does this mean? And what I would say is three things what plant breeding means. It can address a consumer need for a better product, whatever that is in terms of quality. It can uh, impact on a farmer's need in increasing economic yield, because if you don't have economic yield, it's not going to be grown. And the other thing it can do is, in fact, address environmental needs. So they're the three messages. It's very simple. Um, market share. Uh, we used to have a lot more from Scottish Plant Breeding Station um, uh, in terms of potatoes. But when the government, uh, back in the 80s, and with, in fact, the Thatcher government, uh, in fact, plant breeding was deemed to be near market. So actually having plant breeders paid for uh, by the public purse was not allowed, and that's what Milnfield has done. We have stepped in, and we now employ uh, the plant breeders or the field geneticists. Uh, for black currants, we've got 96% of the UK market, 50% of uh, the global, and raspberries as well, if you eat raspberries that are from floricanes, uh, not primocanes, they'll be our varieties. Um, these are some of our potato varieties. We've got the number one organic uh, uh, variety. It used to be resistant to blight, but Phytophthora is uh, in the sort of arms race against the plant, is, is ahead here, and we haven't got uh, highly resistant varieties to blue 13. 
Bale's Emerald has got good water use efficiency. And, and some interesting ones, this is a diploid potato, and Milnfield was the first to release a Foreca variety, Solanum Foreca, uh, in Europe. So again, supporting novelty and what consumers uh, want. So what does all this mean? We were the first as well um, to look at economic impact, and impact is important, whether it's in terms of the quality of a research publication, or the numbers of publications, or the amount of grant money, but also if you're doing technology transfer and commercialization, economic impact is very important. So we were the first to employ a company called DTZ. They employ economists, and they use Treasury Green Book. What they looked at was direct market price, and a direct market price is what someone is prepared to pay for something. It doesn't take into account knowledge. It doesn't take into account environmental improvements, because you could debate those. We only went on direct market price of what people are prepared to buy. So this is where, and this is out and out uh, marketing, and please excuse me for doing this, but I thought it might be something different. I actually went along, and as we're starting, black currants. So when they did this analysis, that apparently that we are generating somewhere between, 30, it's, a, it's a huge gap, 33 to 67 million uh, in the economy because of this. And as I said, all the black currants are there, uh, come from uh, the James Hutton Institute. Raspberries, people think, oh, raspberries, what a small minor crop. Um, the Royal, this, these are from Spain, they're called Glen Lion, so when you're shopping, please all look out for Glen Lion because it will lead to royalty income that will go back into science and education. These, we do, these are from our supermarkets both, and I couldn't be partisan and just go to Sainsbury's, so we went to Tesco's as well. They're both packets there. The royalty income per annum, total royalty, it's not what MRS gets because we have agents in Spain, uh, is half a million pounds per year. One minor crop, one territory. It's quite a lot of money, that, 500,000 for raspberries. So please keep, they're very, also very good for you. Uh, in the UK, we're not growing raspberries at the moment. Uh, however, obviously using processed ones, it's really nice of Mr. Sainsbury to actually put Glen Ample, is the name of the variety, it's the number one in the UK, onto their yogurts in Taste the Difference. It goes into maybe more interesting products, Melville Breweries from Edinburgh. They make Innocent Gun, which is one of my favorite beers. But also they make a raspberry one, which is pretty good. They also put Glen Ample on it. They're doing our marketing for us. It's brilliant. Uh, that works all the way through into jams, that these jams are made with Glen Ample, surprisingly. Uh, all our raspberries are named after, after uh, Glens. Uh, we also had the number one blackberry, which is called Loch Ness. Uh, uh, we didn't know when we named it, it was going to be a monster of a raspberry, excuse me, uh, taking up the number one position. And the black currants are named after Ben's. I will leave these about, but all these products right down to, um, there's a uh, Tabry jam and there's a Tabry, I think there's a Tabry beer here. Tabry's actually came from Dundee. So that's on the fruit side. You can see the economic impact. And on the potato side, we did very much the same. I've shown you a slide about them, but just to show they are real. These were bought last night. This is Lady Balfour. It clearly says Lady Balfour. It was a really nice piece of naming, because as I said, we had the biggest trial of GM potatoes outside, right? Lady Balfour was the founder of the Soil Association. I had a bit of fun with that, with our partners. Uh, also, this is our newest one. This is called Jemson. Um, it is being grown in uh, the Middle East at the moment, and uh, they're looking really good, unlike potatoes uh, from the UK. So that was Jemson. Anya, interesting bit of naming, not us, uh, but Anya was bred by us. Uh, it's a novelty from Sainsbury's in a named bag. Anya is, in fact, uh, Lord Sainsbury's wife. Now, I could imagine na naming a rose after my wife or something like that. <laughs> but, uh, but a potato, I don't think she'd be too pleased. Um, 
And finally, uh, this one is in a value pack, uh, or jackets, value pack. You can see the skin finish is pretty appalling. Uh, this is Vale's Emerald. It does really well in dry conditions. But this will bomb out of the market because of the wet season last year. Growers will not take a chance again. And this one has great water use efficiency. So we'll have to hang on to it long enough. And finally, we also breed... Uh, these things. And for those of you who know anything about geography, under Brassicas in the UK, uh, we have about the area of Kinross, which is a county, are growing our Brassicas. So for every pound of government money um, that we generate 17 in the economy, and that is very, very high uh, figure. Most figures for research institutes are somewhere between 7 and 10. So 17, and it's all down to the plant breeding. Uh, just economics of plant breeding very quickly is um, BSPB uh, looked at this as well, economic impact. And in fact, plant breeding to the UK is generating, for every pound invested in research, generates 40 in the economy. Uh, and that's a really high figure. And they invest an awful lot in R&D. They invest up to 30% of their income in R&D, and the UK average is only 1.6%. And my conclusions are about partnerships, how important uh, they are, um, the importance of plant breeding, and uh, also have your voice with the agri-science technology group. Thank you.